Books, books, books. Whole shelves of books. How the scholars argue, and will go on arguing. But let's get behind the books and look for the cause. The theatre man, the actor, the manager, as well as the poet. Always writing with his boyhood and the countryside echoing in his mind. I would there were no age between ten and three and twenty, or that youth would sleep out the rest. For there is nothing in the between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancientry, stealing, fighting. Birds, animals, flowers. He saw them with a loving eye all his life. In boyhood, they were all round his home. Surely a happy home. The ouselcock so black of hue with orange tawny bill. The throstle with his note so true. The wren with little quill. And when thou hast on foot the purblind hare, mark the poor wretch to overshoot his troubles how he outruns the wind and with what care he cranks and crosses with a thousand doubles. By this poor Wat, far off upon a hill with listening ear, to hearken if his foes pursue him still. Look when a painter would surpass the life in liming out a well-proportioned steed. His art with nature's workmanship at strife, as if the dead the living should exceed, so did this horse excel a common one in shape, in courage, colour, pace and bone. Round hoofed, short jointed, fetlocks shag and long, broad breast, full eye, small head and nostril wide, high crest, short ears, straight legs and passing strong, thin mane, thick tail, broad buttock, tender hide. But such a day tomorrow as today, and to be boy eternal. Young Will went home to the house in Henley Street, Stratford, where his family lived. It was a busy home beside the workshop of his father, John Shakespeare, who dealt in gloves and leather and in wool, hides and possibly in meat as well. John was prosperous for a time and important in that town of Stratford. He was borough chamberlain, which meant that he looked after the accounts. He became an alderman just after Will was born in April 1564. Will's mother came of a good Midland family, the Ardens. She had lost two girls before Will was born. He would be a dearly treasured son. A brother and two young sisters were with him in the home when he was ten. John's business wasn't doing so well as Will grew older, but there was a free place for him at the grammar school a few minutes' walk away. Did he go crawling like a snail unwillingly to school? Perhaps. The hours were long and started early, six in summer, seven in winter. Including breaks, it was a ten-hour day. It was a hard grind with harsh discipline. Flicks of the cane kept the boys at their Latin. There was a lot of Latin which served young Shakespeare well in his writing later on. He liked the poetry, especially the tales of Ovid. He didn't think much of his teachers, if we can judge by the schoolmasters in his plays. His headmaster for some years was a Welshman, Thomas Jenkins. A caricature of such a one appears as Sir Hugh Evans in The Merry Wives of Windsor, teaching Latin. With Shakespeare, but slightly older, was a boy called Richard Field, who went to London and became a printer. Their friendship was kept up. In the schools at that time, tragedies by Seneca, comedies by Plautus were part of the school curriculum. The boys had a chance to act, but in Latin again. This must have been a welcome change from sitting all day at a desk. But far better fun, the real actors were about. The strolling players of the road, protected by the noblemen whose name they carried, Lord Leicester's men, Lord Barclay's men and so on. 
These companies came frequently to Stratford during Shakespeare's boyhood. He would be there, watching the gestures, drinking in the lines, absorbed and wondering. There was more to be done than Latin. When young Will grew to man's estate, a living had to be earned. The obvious place was in his father's business. He knew all about it. There are nearly 50 references in his plays to gloves of various kinds. Tradition says that John Shakespeare was also a butcher and that Will exercised his father's trade, but when he killed a calf, he'd do it in a fine style and make a speech. The butcher takes away the calf and binds the wretch and beats it when it strays, leading it to the bloody slaughterhouse. That's not the voice of one who liked his job. But to kill a calf was then a phrase for declaiming a speech, so he may have avoided the bloodshed altogether. Anyhow, he had too many brains to settle easily to such fleshy work. It's likely enough that he spent some time in a lawyer's office. Shakespeare's plays and poems are full of legal terms which seem to come easily to his mind. He laughed at their jargon. Why might not that be the skull of a lawyer? Where be his quidits now, his quillets, his cases, his tenures and his tricks? Hmm, this fellow might be in his time a great buyer of land, with his statutes, his recognances, his fines, his double vouchers, his recoveries in this the fine of his fines, and the recovery of his recoveries. Will his vouchers vouch him no more of his purchases and double ones too than the length and breadth of a pair of indentures? What has this to do with Prince Hamlet? Wasn't it Shakespeare remembering dull days in a Stratford office? He may have drifted from the law to teaching and tutoring, even to some playful poaching. Charlcote Park, the home of Sir Thomas Lucy, four miles out of Stratford, was the scene of this youthful legend. Shakespeare was early in love and wrote with delight of its springtime. It was a lover and his lass with a hen and a hawk and a hen on in up and a hen on in up in door. What o'er the green corn field did pass in springtime? In springtime, in springtime, the only pretty ring time when birds, when birds do sing. Hey, ding a ding a ding. Hey, ding a ding a ding. Hey, ding a ding a ding. Sweet lovers love the spring in springtime. In springtime, in springtime, the only pretty ring time when birds, when birds do sing. Hey, ding a ding a ding. Hey, ding a ding a ding. Hey, ding a ding a ding. Sweet lovers love the spring. Oh, love, be moderate. May thy ecstasy in measure reign thy joy. Scant this excess, I feel too much thy blessing. Make it less, for fear I surf it. When he was eighteen and a half, he married Anne Hathaway. She was a farmer's daughter in the nearby village of Shottery, eight years older than him and three months with child. There's a mystery here. Stratford was in the Sea of Worcester and Shakespeare went to Worcester in November 1582 to get his marriage licensed. There, the registrar made an entry. But in the bishop's register, the entry records that William Shakespeare was to marry Anne Waitley of Temple Grafton. Waitley is a well-known name in the district. Temple Grafton is a village about six miles from Stratford. Was he trying to slip out of his affair with Anne Hathaway and marry another younger woman? Anyway, he was prevented. Two Stratford farmers appeared the next day and agreed to put down 40 pounds, an enormous sum in those days, as security against trouble for the bishop if Will was married to Anne Hathaway with only one reading of the bands. It's generally claimed that Waitley was a careless mistake, a slip of the pen for Hathaway. Possibly. But how could Temple Grafton be a mistake for Stratford? There must have been some pressure from the Hathaways and Shottery folk. Why otherwise the large sums of money?
Perhaps the unfortunate Miss Wakeley was beaten at the post. Marry in haste, repent at leisure. Did it happen that way? Not altogether. Shakespeare later was much away in London, but he came back to Anne Hathaway, who was Mrs. William Shakespeare to the end. They had three children. Susanna had been born in 1583, and twins, Hamnet and a girl Judith, were to be born two years later. Meanwhile, even with the addition of a family, it's open to doubt whether the young Shakespeare worked only in Stratford. His plays show that he had a detailed knowledge of certain parts of Gloucestershire. He refers to the South Cotswolds as those high hills and rough, uneven ways. In Richard II, he gives a local detail of Barclay Castle. There stands the castle by yon tuft of trees. There's also an old tradition that Shakespeare did some teaching in the vicinity of the castle. He may have been a tutor. Barclay had a team of players, and Shakespeare would have seen them. They must have been fascinating to the young man if he was tired of the law, tired of teaching, and, as we say, stage struck. Say. Back in Stratford, somewhat about 1587, when he was 23 years old, he made the great decision. He would act, he would write, he would go. Lord Leicester's men were in Stratford that year and short of a player. To join them would be a wonderful change. No doubt there would be some scratching of heads in Stratford. Was he to be a rogue and vagabond, as actors were legally termed? He couldn't earn much to start with, so how could he send money back to his family? The River Avon was his Rubicon. We only know that he went to London and that somehow his family managed. Now behold, in the quick forge and working house of thought, how London doth pour out her citizens. Here was everything, a bustling city where there was finery of all kinds, finery of dress, of speech, of poetry, of music. The young noblemen who made the inns of court a kind of university were game for anything, as soldiers, as sailors if the call came, and eager for their arts too. They were as ready with a sonnet as a sword. They had their singers and musicians. They relished the carnal sports of bull and bear baiting. But they also loved this new pleasure of the theatre, a real professional expert theatre, and not just school and college play acting. Hola, ye pampered jades of Asia! What, can ye draw by 20 miles a day and have so proud a chariot at your heels and such a coachman as great Chamberlain? But from the sconces where I conquered you to Byron here, where thus I honour you, the horse that guide the golden eye of heaven and blow the morning from their nostrils, making their fiery gate above the clouds, are not so honoured in their governor as you, ye slaves, in mighty Tamburlaine. The headstrong jades of Thrace Alcides tamed, that King Aegeus fed with human flesh, and made so wanton that they knew their strengths were not subdued with valour more divine than you by this unconquered arm of mine. <laughs> Edward Elaine was the actor playing Tamburlaine. And the author and chief writer of the plays was Christopher Marlowe, a fiery, quarrelsome fellow, but able to pour out a torrent of mighty words. Shakespeare learned from Marlowe and echoed him for a while. Since his arrival in London, Shakespeare began to work his way up. 
players had to be learning new plays constantly. There were no long runs, so they rehearsed and performed without cease. He was liked and befriended by the wealthy nobleman who loved to play. Shakespeare's first London lodgings that we know about were outside the walls to the north of the city in Shoreditch, close to where the first theatres had been built. As far as we know, he never brought his family to London. He had his writing to do as well as play acting, collaborating with others until it was seen that he could do much better by himself. He was called Jack of All Trades. He was envied for his speed and versatility by writers from the universities who resented this upstart crow from a country town. During his apprentice years, he had been hard at work on all sorts of subjects. English history, the three Henry VI plays, a classical farce, the comedy of errors, and a Roman tragedy, Titus Andronicus. Crude in its stream of blood, but having some exquisite, truly Shakespearean lines. Come and take choice of all my library, and so beguile thy sorrow. Not even Marlowe could write like that. Men of taste, such as the Earl of Southampton, began to notice the young man who had such poetry inside him. His patron was good-looking, extravagant, generous, a man with an ear for poetry. Shakespeare wrote two long narrative poems, Venus and Adonis, and The Rape of Lucrece. They were both printed by a Stratford friend, Richard Field, and they were widely bought and read. Both were dedicated to the Earl, and in the case of Lucrece, the formal offering was very warmly phrased. The love I dedicate to your Lordship is without end. What I have done is yours. What I have to do is yours. Being part in all I have, devoted yours. The plague raged in London in 1592-93, and the theatres were closed. These were hard times for the players. They had to tour or starve. But Shakespeare wrote, perhaps in the peace and security of Southampton's home in Hampshire. He would have been a welcome guest, and he gives us a self-portrait. A merrier man within the limit of becoming mirth, I never spent an hour's talk with all. His eye begets occasion for his wit, for every object that the one doth catch, the other turns to a mirth-moving jest, which his fair tongue, conceits expositor, delivers in such apt and gracious words that aged ears play truant at his tales, and younger hearings are quite ravishing. Shakespeare began to write his sonnets, the first sequence in devotion to a man, opinion favouring Southampton as the man. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Not marble, nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme. But you shall shine more bright in these contents than unswept stone besmeared with sluttish time. Accuse me thus, that I have scanted all wherein I should your great deserts repay. Forgot upon your dearest love to call, whereto all bonds do tie me day by day. That I have frequent been with unknown minds, and given to time your own dear purchased right. Nicholas Rowe, a poet laureate who wrote the first life of Shakespeare, said that Southampton gave the poet a thousand pounds to carry through a purchase which he had a mind to. The Earl was in financial trouble and a thousand pounds would be a huge amount. A hundred pounds seems more likely, for that would bring the young Shakespeare a share in the company of the Lord Chamberlain's men, which had just been founded. They were known as the Chamberlain's men because they were under the Lord Chamberlain's patronage. The theatre itself was partly open to the sky, and the actors performed on a platform with a penthouse roof over it. Performances were given in the afternoon, with an audience draw from all classes, noblemen to apprentices. They paid a penny at the entrance to get into the yard where the groundlings stood. For another penny you could obtain a seat, a further penny, a cushion seat. A stool on the stage cost you sixpence, 
Average receipts per performance were between eight pounds and nine pounds, shall we say a hundred pounds in present day money. At the end of the week, this money was divided up among the actors. A company of actors consisted of about eight men, all of whom invested capital in a common stock of plays and apparel, sharing the profits in proportion to their investments. So they were called sharers. This was known as a fellowship of players. Kemp was the clown and Burbage the tragedian. Hemming and Condal were also important to this community. The theatre was a highly organised commercial concern made to run at a profit. To become a sharer, Shakespeare would have had to raise some capital. As a playwright, he wouldn't have earned a great deal. The theatre company bought his plays outright for between five and eight pounds apiece. That gift of Southampton's may have solved his problem. In the theatre, he knew that that was where there was money to be made. He worked with and for this fellowship of players for the rest of his active life. Two years later, Shakespeare's son Hamnet was taken very ill. We don't know if the poet arrived in time to see the boy before he died, but it's impossible to read King John, which he started to write later that year, without hearing an echo of Shakespeare's grief. The first male child, to him that did but yesterday aspire, there was not such a gracious creature born, but now will canker sorrow eat my bud and chase the native beauty from his cheek and he will look as hollow as a ghost as dim and meagre as an ague's fit and so he'll die and rising so again when I shall meet him in the court of heaven I shall not know him Shakespeare's only son was dead. The rest of the Shakespeare family still lived in the house in Henley Street. Anne, his wife, Hamlet's twin, Judith, and Susanna, her elder sister. His father and mother were still alive, as well as a sister and three brothers. From now on, we hear no more of his father being in financial trouble. The claim was renewed for the grant of arms that John Shakespeare had applied for 20 years before. And later the same year, he was granted a coat of arms. The year after Hamlet's death, Shakespeare bought New Place for £60. It was the largest house in Stratford. There's little doubt that Shakespeare thought a great deal of his social status, which was measured by the money he could earn and the property he could invest it in. What a triumph for the young man over whose career there must have been doubts. At 32, he had the big house in his hometown and his family were established as considerable people. As he lived in lodgings in London, Shakespeare couldn't have had a big library of his own. But for writing history plays, he must have been able to refer to his own copy of Hollinshed's Chronicles. Only a few of his plots were original. For the most part, he took them from old plays, novels, storybooks and poems. Another of Shakespeare's source books was Plutarch's Lives of the Greeks and Romans. This was published by the firm his friend Richard Field had entered as a young apprentice. The poet found the material here to write Julius Caesar, Coriolanus and Antony and Cleopatra. Shakespeare would have had access to a good library through his friendship with John Florio. Florio was a North Italian Protestant who was Lord Southampton's tutor and later his secretary. This, of course, was where the Italian influence came in. Italian novelists provided Shakespeare with a lot of his stories, especially Boccaccio, who wrote the Decameron. The poet never copied other writers. He expressed what they had to give in his own way. 
Mario himself undoubtedly told Shakespeare a great deal about Italy and showed him drawings and prints. But whatever Shakespeare set his plays, the characters had their roots deep in English soil. In 1598, Shakespeare with the Chamberlain's men were playing at the theatre in North London when the lease of the ground on which the theatre was built expired and the landlord wanted to claim the property that was built on it. The Burbages were determined not to allow this and so, after a performance just before Christmas of that year, they had the theatre dismantled. They then hired a large number of carts to transport the material from Shoreditch to the north bank of the Thames. From there it was ferried across to Bankside and many of the timbers helped to build the Globe Theatre. The expenses of the new building were shared by the chief members of the company, which included Shakespeare. The theatre opened next autumn with a performance of Henry V. No play of the poets could have been more apt to the mood of the nation. England was becoming a first-class power in Europe, in spite of the many anxieties experienced during Elizabeth's reign. Shakespeare spoke for England. When the players moved their theatre to the south of the river, Shakespeare also moved his lodgings to Bankside, so that he'd still be living near his work. During these years, it's said that he paid an annual visit to his home at Stratford, but it's difficult to imagine the poet living for the rest of the year without the company of women. The intimate references to a dark lady in his earliest comedy, Love's Labour's Lost, rise to a climax in the second sequence of the sonnets. He refers to her as his mistress, and he gives us a very precise picture of the lady, a pale-skinned, red-lipped, black-haired woman with eyes of gleaming black, witty, fond of music, alluring, maddening, magical, utterly wanton. Many of the sonnets showed his resentment and disgust for the weakness that enslaves men to such women. My love is as a fever, longing still for that which longer nurseth the disease, feeding on that which doth preserve the ill, the uncertain sickly appetite to please. My reason, the physician to my love, angry that his prescriptions are not kept, hath left me. And I, desperate now, approve, desire is death, which physic did accept. Past cure I am, now reason is past care, and frantic mad with ever more unrest. My thoughts and my discourse, as madmen's are, at random from the truth vainly expressed. For I have sworn thee fair, and thought thee bright, who art as black as hell, as dark as night. Perhaps Shakespeare found consolation in male company at the Mermaid Tavern. The innkeeper was a friend of his. Here he could meet Ben Johnson, his only rival of any note. The two men were great friends. They could meet at the Friday meetings at the Mermaid Tavern, surrounded by fellow actors and writers, mixing jests and argument. Actors and writers always talk shop. Of course, they'd argue how a play should be written. Ben Johnson may have drunk as fast and hard as any, but he wrote very slowly, had a great respect for learning and the classics, and was a bundle of theories. Shakespeare wrote swiftly, relying on his natural intuition and wit. He didn't care a jot if he mixed up tragedy, comedy, and fantasy, all in the same play. Although Ben Johnson was always critical of his fellow playwright, after Shakespeare's death, he wrote, I loved the man, and to honor his memory on this side idolatry as much as any. He was indeed honest, and of an open and free nature, had an excellent fantasy, brave notions and gentle expressions. Ben Jonson may have had good reasons for being grateful to Shakespeare. When the Chamberlain's men performed Johnson's play, Every Man in His Humour, the year they moved to the Globe, the story goes that the company had turned the play down, but that Shakespeare, after reading it, persuaded his fellow actors to give it a performance. 
Shakespeare's name heads the list of the actors who took part. Shakespeare had a big say in the company's affairs, and it seems that he supervised the production of his own plays. As he worked with the same company for nearly 20 years, and during that time the personnel, except for the boy players, changed very little, he always knew which actor was eventually going to play the character he was creating. He must have discussed the various parts with the actors. He knew how he wanted them played. Hamlet's talk to the players contains the best advice anybody has ever given to actors. Speak to speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, trippingly on the tongue. But if you mouth it as many of your players do, I had as lief the town crier had spoke my lines. <laughs> Nor do not saw the air too much with your hands thus, but use all gently. For in the very torrent, tempest, and as I may say, the whirlwind of passion, you may acquire and beget a temperance that may give it smoothness. Oh, it offends me to the soul! to hear a robustious, periwig-pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, who, for the most part, are capable of nothing but inexplicable dumb shows and noise. I could have such a fellow whipped for all doing termagant. In our Herod's Herod. Pray you avoid it. Be not too tame, neither, but let your own discretion be your tutor. Suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance. That your step not the modesty of nature, for anything too overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end both at the first and now was and is, to hold as twere the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own feature, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time his form and pressure. Shakespeare then makes a reference to the crowns, which applied particularly to Will Kemp. He alone of the original players left the company when they moved to the Globe. Robert Armin took his place. We have it on very good authority that Kemp used to put in gags of his own. It is evident that the poet disapproved. And let those that play your clowns speak no more than is set down for them. For the be of them that will themselves laugh to set on some quantity of barren spectators to laugh too. But Though I... in the meantime some necessary question of the play be then to be considered. That's villainous and shows a most pitiful ambition in the fool that uses it. Go, make you ready. Go. Shakespeare often acted before the Queen, and she saw many of his plays performed. The demand for new plays during her reign was excessive, and there's little doubt that the poet had to write some of his plays very quickly. It was fortunate that he happened to be that kind of writer. He was about to write yet another in great haste. Elizabeth came with the court to the Palace of Whitehall for Christmas every year, and the revels, as they were called, were held from December the 26th until 12th night on the 6th of January. During that period, one or other of the London companies of players performed a play each evening. In December 1600, the Queen heard that an Italian nobleman, Don Virginio Orsino, the Duke of Bracciano, was on his way to England to pay her a visit. She must entertain him in an appropriate manner. She sends for her cousin, Lord Hunsdon, her Lord Chamberlain. The Queen tells him of the Duke's visit. He will be at the palace for Twelfth Night. A new play must be written, suitable for the occasion. Next day, while the actors of Shakespeare's company were assembling and preparations going forward for a regular performance at the Globe Theatre, Shakespeare arrived with the news that he had just seen the Lord Chamberlain, who wanted a new play ready for performance on Twelfth Night. It must be a play that shall be best furnished with rich apparel, of great variety and change of music and dances, and of a subject that may be most pleasing to Her Majesty. The script must be topical, full of personal allusions and compliments. Shakespeare was not the only member of the company forced to work quickly. Hemming and Condell would have to organize the copying of the parts, a timetable for rehearsals, and for the office of the revels to make the costumes and properties. 
And so Shakespeare began to write the play he called Twelfth Night or What You Will. He took the bare bones of an old Italian comedy and further complicated the plot by making each of his characters fall in love. Viola is in love with Orsino, and Orsino is in love with Olivia. She falls in love with Viola, believing Viola to be a man. Sir Andrew Aguecheek is also in love with Olivia. Sir Toby Belch, the fat knight, is helping Aguecheek to press his suit, but is himself in love with Mariah. Malvolio is in love with Olivia too, and is tricked into believing that she responds to his love. From this slender material, Shakespeare evolved a neat little plot capable of sustaining some excellent fooling, and over it all, he wove the web of the most delicate poetry. As Shakespeare wrote, so the scribes would start copying out the parts for the actors. They were written on half sheets of foolscap and pasted together to make a long roll. And so the process continued day and night until the play was finished. Then a messenger called at Shakespeare's lodgings for the last pages of the newly written play. Sir Edmund Tilney, master of the Queen's Revels, then read a fair copy of the play and passed it for performance. He supervised the royal entertainments and ensured that no words of the actors would be offensive to the Queen. In Twelfth Night, the language is most polite. Tilney may have congratulated Shakespeare on his restraint, no blasphemous oaths, and so no offence to the high-ranking prelates who would be present in the audience. The actors rehearsed the plays for the Queen's Revels at the Master of the Revels premises at Clerkenwell in the city, north of the river. Twelfth Night is a convenient play to rehearse in a hurry, as there are two sets of characters who don't come together very often until the final scene of the play. possible in the early stages of rehearsal for the big comedy scenes with Malvolio, Sir Toby and his confederates to be going on in one room, while the lyrical scenes between the Duke and Viola were being rehearsed in another. The boy players who took the women's parts until their voices broke were usually apprentices to the most experienced actors in the company, so that they learnt their craft under the most expert supervision. And, of course, Shakespeare was also there to give his help and advice. Robert Armin, who played the part of Feste the Clown, could also be rehearsing his songs when he was not wanted for a particular scene. At the same time, the staff of office for Malvolio was being made by the property men. and the pavilions known as the houses were being made by the carpenters and painters. And so the actors rehearsed and perfected themselves in their parts. In the royal wardrobe, the costumes were being completed, ready for the characters of the play. When a production was being mounted for the revels, new costumes were provided at the Queen's expense. As the tension mounted, there came the day of the final rehearsal. 
the wind and the rain, but that's all one. Our play is done, and we'll strive to please you. From Clerkenwell, the actors rode through the streets of London to the Queen's Palace at Whitehall. Queen is entertaining the Duke of Bracciano in another part of the palace, the ladies and gentlemen of the court dance in the great hall until it's time for the play to commence. Meanwhile, the players are putting the finishing touches to their costumes and makeup. Music be the food of love, play on, give me excess of it, that surfeiting the appetite may sicken, and so die. That strain again, it had a dying fall. Oh, it came on my ear like the sweet south that breathes upon a bank of violets, stealing and giving odor. Enough, no more. It is not so sweet now as it was before. O oh, spirit of love, how quick and fresh art thou, that notwithstanding thy capacity receiveth as the sea, naught enters there of what validity and pitch soe'er, but falls into abatement and low price even in a minute. So full of shapes is fancy, that it alone is high fantastical. When the Queen died in 1603, the players must have felt that the world had come to an end. But with the coming of King James, they fared better in many ways. Less than a month after his accession, a royal license was issued, and Shakespeare's company became the King's Players. James saw five times as many plays a year as Elizabeth, and the major part of these were presented by the King's Men. During Elizabeth's reign, the poet had been mostly commended for his comedies and histories, but with a Stuart on the throne, the spirit of the age changed, and Shakespeare set about writing the tragedies Othello, King Lear, Macbeth, Antony and Cleopatra. James had written a book on demonology, and it's considered that Macbeth was written as a compliment to James because of his interest in witchcraft. The poet drew on Hollinshed's chronicle for the story of the play, in which there was an illustration of Macbeth confronting the three witches. King Lear was another play which grew from the pages of this chronicle. Shakespeare may have been on tour with the players when he was turning over ideas for King Lear. There are passages which must have been based on personal observation. For instance, Edgar's speech when he pretends he has led his blind father Gloucester to the edge of the cliffs of Dover. How Fearful and dizzy it is to cast one's eyes so low. 
The crows and chuffs that wing the midway air show scarce so gross as beetles. Halfway down hangs one that gathers samphire. Dreadful trade. Methinks he seems no bigger than his head. The fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice. And yon tall anchoring bark diminished to her cock. Her cock a boy almost too small for sight. The murmuring surge that on the unnumbered idle pebbles chafes cannot be heard so high. I'll look no more. The King's Men were at Dover in the late summer of 1606. King Lear was first produced in December of the same year, so it's reasonable to assume that Shakespeare was with the players at Dover and wrote the cliff scenery passage, whether then or just after. It's difficult to equate Shakespeare's busy life as a player and man of the theatre with that of a gentleman of Stratford. But his eventual retirement must have been something he contemplated ever since he bought New Place. From 1609 onwards, he seems to have spent more time each year at Stratford. He still wrote plays, but there's a marked change in style. He's finished with high tragedy. The new mood is one of reconciliation. The stories are more fanciful, and they all end happily. Shakespeare's eldest daughter, Susanna, now married to Dr. John Hall, had recently given birth to a daughter, Elizabeth. In his family surroundings, the poet's mind turned to the charm of young people, which evoked his delightful girl heroines, Imogen, Perdita, Marina, and lastly, Miranda in The Tempest. The Tempest is always considered to be Shakespeare's farewell to the stage. The idea for the play came to him in an interesting way. One of Shakespeare's friends was Thomas Russell, who lived near Stratford. Shakespeare appointed Russell the overseer of his will, what we should call his executor. Russell's stepson was Sir Dudley Diggs, who was very much concerned with founding the colony of Virginia. It's tempting to think that they met the poet at New Place and told him of the separation of two of the ships sent out to Virginia by the company and of their wreck in a great storm off the island of Bermuda, an island supposed to be enchanted and inhabited by witches and devils. The two ships were saved and after ten months one of them was repaired and able to sail to Virginia where it arrived safely, much to the surprise of the crew's fellow Englishmen who had thought them quite lost. His play, The Tempest, opens with a shipwreck. The action takes place on an island which is full of magic. And at the close, the ship is miraculously repaired and all the characters set sail for Milan. Prospero, the central figure of the play, is a magician, a superman. It was he who raised the tempest which caused the shipwreck. All the other characters are puppets in his hands. We don't know how much of himself the poet wrote into the part of Prospero, but some of the speeches seem to be those of a man who feels his working life in the theatre is coming to an end. Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits, and are melted into air, into thin air, and like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. In March 1616, Shakespeare made his last will and testament. He made certain changes in a previous draft owing to the marriage of his younger daughter, Judith. The will was drawn up by Francis Collins, a Warwickshire solicitor. In making his will, 
Shakespeare had one dominant idea, to leave all his property intact to a single male descendant, and so fulfill his father's desire of founding a Shakespeare family among the landed gentry of Warwickshire. Consequently, he left all the property to his eldest daughter, and then to the sons of her daughter, Elizabeth Hall. But if she had no sons, then the sons of Judith, the poet's younger daughter, were to inherit. Unfortunately, there were no male heirs. All Shakespeare's grandchildren died without issue. His wife is only mentioned in relation to the bequest of the second best bed. But Shakespeare had no need to make further provision, because she was entitled by common law to one third of her husband's heritable estates and to a home in his principal mansion house. He left money for memorial rings to the only surviving members of his original company. To my fellows John Hemming, Richard Burbage, and Henry Condell. Francis Collins signed as a witness, so did four other Stratford neighbours. Thomas Russell also signed as overseer. Shakespeare put his signature on each page of the will. By me, William Shakespeare. Less than a month passed before Shakespeare died at the age of 52. He was buried in Holy Trinity Church, Stratford. Seven years after the poet's death, Hemming and Condell completed the work that Shakespeare had entrusted to them. They edited and published all his plays in one volume known as the First Folio. Only a certain number of the 37 plays attributed to the poet had been published in the quarters during his lifetime. If it hadn't been for the devotion of these two men, nearly half of Shakespeare's work would have been lost to us. In their preface to the reader, Hemming and Condell said of Shakespeare, his mind and hand went together and what he thought he uttered with that easiness that we have scarce received from him a blot in his papers. But it is not our province who only gather his works and give them to you to praise him. It is yours that read him. Read him, therefore, and again and again. And if then you do not like him, surely you are in manifest danger not to understand him.